Hello, welcome to the Frugal Fit Mom podcast. My name is Christine, your host, and I am extremely excited about today's guest. It is none other than Cass from Clutterbug. You can go to clutterbug.com and find her everywhere. She has multiple courses. She even has a TV show on HGTV, Hot Mess House. You can find it on Discovery Plus for you streaming people. She is the organizing expert. She is also one of my favorite people, wildly funny. If you have not met her, I'm sure you are going to love this episode. And if you have met her, I know that you are excited about the following conversation. So everywhere that you can find Cass will be in the show notes today or in the description box if you are watching the video version. Without further ado, let's go have a chat with my friend Cass. Cass, welcome to the podcast. Oh crap, I thought you there was more coming. Yes, no, hi, that's, that's really Thank about you. it. I'll do an intro separately. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I, I, I just think you're awesome. So um, <gasps> I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, I think you're awesome. I'm actually super, super excited to have you on here because I have some questions today. Hit me. I have some answers, maybe. Oh, okay. Hopefully. So I don't think there's anyone watching this who doesn't already know who you are. I'm sure there is, but that's very kind to say. Thank you. But I don't think so. I think they probably know who you are, but in case there's like one or two that don't know who you are, I mean, you're an organizing expert, but what else would you have them know about you? It feels very strange to have people call me an organizing expert. I'm Cass from Clutterbug. I'm a mom to three. Almost all of them are teenagers, which is terrifying. I live in Canada but I say a bout, not a boot, so winning. Um, And I'm a recovering super slob. I used to struggle. Listen, I'm going to be honest. I'm still a messy person. I struggle with all things that I consider adulting, if that makes sense. So doing big girl things, being like responsible and grown up, those things have never came naturally to me. And I found out recently that I actually have ADHD, which makes so much sense. But on top of that, it's just life is hard. It's a lot to juggle. And even making dinner sometimes, like, oh, man, I didn't take anything out to frost. I find all of this challenging. And I feel like more challenging than maybe the average person does. So I'm always on the hunt for hacks and tips and tricks to make life easier. And it started with my home. I found a way that I don't have to clean my house all the time, and yet it always stays tidy and organized. And that's really the basis of my whole business now is sharing those tips with other people. I've been watching your videos for a while. I've tried some of your tips. I I still think I need you to come to my house. I'd love to come to your house. (laughs) I've been implementing and I've been decluttering. I've been doing all the things and I just can't seem to get my crap together. So <laughs> if if you were to talk to someone like me, I mean, you're talking to me now, but if it was also someone like me, they're like, I'm doing the things I've, I took the quiz and I bought the bins and I've decluttered and I still can't do it. What would you say? What help can you give me? I- Yeah. So here's the thing. It it helps to really know yourself, like to really know yourself. And that's the whole thing of the quiz, but you can't put everybody into, into four categories. I think if you're really struggling, you probably are what I call a macro organizer. So more laid back person when it comes to managing your stuff, which means when you're done with something like a pen, your brain isn't thinking, well, now I've got to open the drawer and put the pen away. Your brain has moved on to something else. And this just kind of lays where it lays. And that's me as well. And that's just the way we manage our stuff. And so we have to adapt our home to catch that clutter and make it really easy. So it's just as easy to put it away as it is to put it down. But then we also have to do things like remind ourselves to go through and put things away throughout the day. We will, there's no getting around that. There's no way that we're not going to have to kind of go back and clean up after ourselves. But the reason why we all feel like this is so hard is because we leave it for too long. We let it go to the end of the day. That's a recipe for disaster. So I guess it's like a two point thing. It's it's having the right system in place, and then it's having that habit 
of daily tidying up. And this is not, don't groan or roll your eyes. This isn't an all day tidy thing. This is like two to five minutes where you race around and just put the pen back in the drawer and the hairbrush back in the drawer. And eventually, like now I'm kind, like I'm not great, but I'm kind of to the point where when I'm done brushing my hair, I'm so used to opening the drawer now and putting it away that I'm doing that nine times out of 10. So I tidy a lot less than when I first started. But at the crux of it, it's kind of knowing yourself. I'm rambling, Christine, but listen. You're not, you're not, you're not rambling at all. As you were talking through that, I was like, okay, what are my main issues? There's two. Well, no, I have four kids. There's six, <laughs> there's, six there's six issues. <laughs> Ignoring the kids and just going to my issues. My issues are twofold. Number one, clean clothes. I don't want to do it. I, I would rather literally do anything. I would rather make dinner and clean the kitchen five times than put away my freaking clean laundry. I hate it. And because I'm an athlete, I have a lot of laundry. I have a lot of workout gear that gets gross. I'm sweaty. I'm smelly. So I'm like constantly washing probably every two, three days, my own things. Like I, I can wash them. I just don't want to put them away. Cause I'm like, why would I put this sports bar away? I'm just going to wear it again tomorrow. That's mm. issue number one. Okay. So how do I get over that laziness aspect of myself? Okay. So I'm hearing two things and I'm just, I'm just mirroring this back to you. One, it's a mindset issue. You are telling yourself you hate it. You've told yourself it's the worst thing on the face of the earth. You've told yourself that under a no, sir, you'd rather scrub a toilet than put this away. You've made it a mountain before you've even started. So mm -hmm. yeah, you've conditioned your brain to tell you that this is absolutely without a doubt, the thing you want to avoid at all costs. And the second thing is you've said that you have a lot. So you, I already know you have an excess of clothing, which means it's probably hard to put away. Like, are you folding your workout gear? Please tell me you're not because you shouldn't. Great. So here's what we do. We get a big old bin in your closet on a shelf or somewhere. And you open it up and you dump the clean laundry into it and you shut the bin or the drawer. <laughs> like, this is what I do. This is how I put away laundry. I don't fold. And anything that doesn't, I don't care. I don't work out a lot. Listen, but if, but I do have like stretchy yoga pants and things like that. I, I literally put it away from across the room. I open up the basket where it goes and I shoot it like basketballs in. And I think you need to create a system that makes it easier for you, step one. And if it isn't easy to put away like that, it's because you have too much. Maybe it's not too much workout clothes. Maybe it's something else that's too much, but you need to have a place where you can toss it away. And if you're like, well, it doesn't all fit unless I fold it properly, you have too much. So number one is make it easier to put away. And number two is change your mindset, man. You got to fake it till you make it. You got to be like, you know what? I deserve to have a bedroom that doesn't have clean clothes all over the place. I'm making this a priority because, oh man, I, I got this. I got so many areas of my life under control. I'm going to nail the crap out of putting away my clothes too. And you're going to see just like changing that mindset, identifying it first of all, and then changing it is going to make things easier. But I don't want you to start folding and making it like, please, please basketball this crap away. I do basketball the socks, sports bras, tank tops, and leggings. I do. Okay. It's the t-shirt drawer. That's the problem. And you're right. They don't fit. They don't fit unless I fold them properly. And even then it's like, <clears throat> so yeah. listen, two days ago. So it's ago, a nightmare. So it's hard. It is. I decluttered and I got rid of like two Walmart bags of like t-shirts and tank tops out of that drawer. So now I can close it. I probably still have too many. Okay. So what about, how can we create more storage? Do you have room mm -hmm. at the end of the bed at all? No, no. That, okay. That's where we walk. Uh, what's under your bed? Like, I hope you have that bed on risers and you have those it's fancy pull-out drawers. I, I do have, you know, those under the bed, like Rubbermaid hard plastic. Yeah. Yeah. I keep, spe I keep special things under there. Okay. So here's what I'm just going to say. I don't, I don't know your house, but it seems like your bedroom has valuable real estate. Mm -hmm. That could be being wasted on things you hardly ever use. I think it's great to keep things under the bed, especially mementos. That's the number one spot I recommend it. But in your case, you're probably accessing those things maybe four times a year tops. So why is it taking up so much square footage? 
Yeah. Right. Is there any other place that we could relocate those? And then if you have those Rubbermaid bins that pull out, they have a hinged lid that you can get. So it feels like a bottom drawer. Super easy. Toss your husband's crap in that and take one of the dresser drawers for yourself for more t-shirt space. I'm just saying, identifying the valuable real estate and kind of like the space suckers, I call them, is important, especially if you have a small space. I go into people's kitchens all the time and they're like, I just don't have enough counter space and I don't have enough for all the things I use and I I have no place for the air fryer to go. And I'll open up their cabinets and I'm like, there's a roast pan and a huge soup pot right there. How often are you using these? And they're like, oh, maybe once a year. Why is it in your kitchen? Why can't we relocate that to the, the basement or the garage? Because they're like, well, it belongs in the kitchen because it's a kitchen thing. But we have to look at our space a little differently. We have to look at the valuable real estate and know that not everything that needs to be stored in the kitchen, only the valuable things we use all the time if we're short on space. So don't be afraid to relocate stuff to make room for the things that matter. What's interesting is I have successfully done that with my kitchen and I have no problems mm. with it. I just haven't done it to my bedroom as well. So I can work on that. Let me ask you a question. It's not like this is the first time we've ever met for those that are listening. We've met a few times in person, by the way, if in case I didn't say it before, you're like one of my favorite people. That's, I love you so one much. Of my favorite people. Stop. Okay. If you were to guess, I took your quiz. Yeah. What kind of, is it organization style? Is that what you name it? Yes. What would you yeah. guess? I am. Okay. So you have a bike hanging on your wall in the background. So, I mean, that's, uh, I'm thinking I would guess butterfly. I would because how did I, you do that? But I haven't seen you, but I, I do feel like you're a little like me and that we're a little flighty. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're a little bit all over the place. So that really is like a, a ladybug or a butterfly mentality, but butterflies are more visual. But again, I haven't seen your space. This could just be a random bike. So you could be a ladybug too. I would have no way of knowing without actually seeing your space, but it doesn't really matter. I hate to say this because like, I know that's the whole thing in my business is like, no, your organizing style. At the end of the day, you don't have to put yourself into four categories. You just need to know yourself. You need to know like, do I have a tendency of leaving all the things I use every day out? Do I like to see the things and have it easy access? Am I a person that's going to take time to open a lid and put something away properly? Or do I need fast, easy, simple solutions? And that self-awareness about your stuff is critical to setting up a system. So many people are like, I went and I bought all the home edit things and I decanted all my nuts and all my, I bought a bunch of pastas in rainbow colors and my pantry looks beautiful. And yet I never use the, it just is for looks. Now I just shove stuff on top or beside or leave things around because that's just not them. And that's okay. It just comes down to knowing yourself. So you can design a home that works and really complements how you naturally live. Well, you're dead on. I am a butterfly mm -hmm. and I tried like my kitchen's my space, right? So I am frequently in my kitchen. I try and organize it all the time. I tried to do the decanty thing like two years ago and yeah, it's, it looks pretty, but it's so it unfunctional. Is that a word? <laughs> Yeah. For you. Not, not functional for mm -hmm. someone like me because I'm always trying new recipes and I'm buying different ingredients all the time and I don't buy the same thing all the time and my needs ebb and flow and it was a disaster. It was just not working. And so my solution, just like the butterfly, like your quiz says that I am, I found like a year ago, these large bins from Walmart. <laughs> macro organization, breakfast, yes. boom, <laughs> done. Because I can change them out yeah. all the time. I don't have to buy the same yeah. cereal, the same cracker, the same flour. I don't. I have a baking bin. Baking oh, stuff yeah. goes in the baking bin. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, that's that's the whole secret, I guess, to macro organization. And honestly, even if you are a detailed person, if you're overwhelmed in life, let's just let's just take a step back and be lazier. Okay, let's just do it because you deserve it. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is you can find things and you can put things away quickly and mm -hmm. stop. And so using what you're saying, 
is what I suggest, especially for butterflies and tray systems. So here's an example. I wreck a bathroom, not in a gross way, but when I get ready in the morning, there is bathroom products like all over the counter. My kids are the same, same way. Mm-hmm. And it's such a pain to put all that away. So what I got was a shallow tray and I put all my bathroom products in there and I installed a shelf on the wall and now I get ready out of the basket. Does that make sense? Like I don't, yes. I just like, and I just throw it back in kind of messily. And then I pick up that whole tray and put it on the shelf to put things away. So I only have to put one thing away, the basket. And even if I don't, it's not a big deal because it's just a basket on the counter and it takes seconds to do it later. So this is the same kind of concept I use in every single area of my home. When I am baking, I have a basket for spices. I bring the whole freaking thing out on the counter beside the cooking and then the whole thing goes away. So I can still be messy. I can still leave things out, but now I just have to put one tray or one basket away when it comes time to clean up. And that's kind of the whole secret to macro organization is using that big container to catch a category. That's how you stay tidy. You know, I was going to tell you my other issue was my bathroom because same story. It's the exact same story as you. I wreck the bathroom counter. Same deal. My makeup, my straighteners out, my face cream and wash. And I can't even remember all the things, but my toothbrush and my toothpaste, and they're all over the counter. Cause I'm like, the toothbrush is wet. I don't want to put it away wet. That's gross. You know, and I don't like things on the counter, but I leave everything on the counter. So it looks crazy. And I tried the, I have a large drawer that's like deep and not functional. So I tried to like separate it out with these smaller containers But the things I use all the time don't fit in the container. So I have to put away 10 things and then take out 10 things then put away 10 things. And I love your large basket idea. I love it. I'm going to take everything out of that. I'm going to have my get ready basket. And it all all comes in and all goes out and it's done. And it's brilliant. Yeah, that's the whole thing. We don't have to worry about like, why would you have Q-tips in there? Because you use them to get ready. Like, oh, I shouldn't put my hair straightener in there because it should go with hair products. Stop that thinking like that. We organize for the way we live. It doesn't have to be some arbitrary like, oh, the hair products have to go together rule. I don't know who came up with that, but they were wrong for (laughs) macro organizers, right? Like there are people out there who need to organize in a really detailed structure way. And then I call this laid back. I don't want to say lazy, but us laid back organizers, we have to adapt for how we naturally make a mess. That's what it really is. So take a look at the things that you're naturally just leaving out and how can you create a home for that stuff right where you naturally leave it? Can you just have a basket right above it on a shelf or beside it? That's really the secret. For people who say that organizing takes too much time, because I have helped a few friends organize their pantries. I'm good with the kitchen stuff. So I tend to help people in their kitchens and pantries. And sometimes people just need a fresh set of eyes Mm -hmm. on like, I don't know what to do. So I can come in and help my friends. I'm nowhere near an expert, but I just like to like help people get rid of clothes that don't fit and appliances they're not using. A lot of people say, oh, organizing takes too much time. I don't have time for this. My life's too busy blah, 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 blah. So what would you say to someone who is saying that to you? I know what I would say in my experience, but what do you say to people? Well, first of all, it's going to save you so much time. Here's the thing. It's going to save you oodles of butt tons of time. But the other thing is we, for some reason, we overestimate how long this is going to take. We think something's going to take hours when it's really going to take minutes. And organization is one of those things. And the reason is most people do it wrong. And so the wrong way to organize is so time consuming. You make a huge mess, you make zero progress, and yet we just all fundamentally believe that this is the way we're supposed to be organizing. And what I mean by this is we don't take everything out and sort it into 50 million piles. You don't empty your pantry and start making piles. That is the death of organization because now you have 50 million piles and now what do you do? you mostly just kind of put it back neatly in these little piles and then it just gets messy again. And you're like, what to do? It's like, well, that was I feel like pointless. you're describing my mom like all day. Man, my mom does that. And she has decision fatigue and she's like, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. And I don't even want to tell you about her upstairs room where she's organizing her books. There's 50 million piles and they've been there for like two months. 
Yeah, the piles are the, it, that's the nightmare uh, because you do get decision fatigue. So mm-hmm. what you do, first of all, you don't, you don't take a whole, a whole pantry out. You start with one shelf and you make two piles. You make a keep and go. And with clothing, it doesn't matter what it is. It's the same thing. It's like, am I keeping this or am I not? And just breaking that down into two piles eliminates decision fatigue and you're way more likely to actually make intentional decisions on what you're keeping and what isn't. When your brain is thinking about what pile and what category should this go in, your anxiety is amped and you're not going to be able to make a clear decision of whether you should keep something or not because your anxiety is high. And when anxiety is high, we want to keep everything because we feel anxious. And so the only thing we're making a decision on is, is this important or not? Is this staying in my house or is it not? And then we go through the keep pile and we say, what do I use the most often? What is the most important thing here? And where can I put that back so it's easiest to access? And that's kind of the secret. It's those two things that will make organizing a lot easier and faster. Mm -hmm. I really, really want you to tell me how your zombie apocalypse novel is going. Oh my God. (laughs) I feel so, I feel so... I'm exposed right now, Christine. Uh, it's Listen, not going you, well. You brought it up. <laughs> I did. I did. I you did. said your yeah. one goal for this year Crap. was to finish Crap. your young adult zombie apocalypse yeah. movie. No, not Sip movie. It. it might be a movie yeah. one day. Maybe. It's Novel. really bad. It's halfway done yeah. already. Oh, God. What it, I thought how's it was that halfway going? done. Well, it's, it's so middle I've... of March. How's that going? Thank you for that. Um <laughs> I have a, I've had, I've had so many laptops that have died and I thought I was using Google drive to store this. Obviously I was adding things on an old laptop, which has now been decluttered long ago. So I have like the first four chapters that I found and I was disappointed because I know I wrote a lot more than that and that's gone. So I'm like, ah, I kind of got to start at the beginning. I'm going to reread this epic in my mind story. It is so bad, Christine. Like it is the worst written garbage I've ever read. I'm mortified to read it. And I'm like, why have I built this up to be this incredible story in my mind? Like for years, I've been working on this thing for years. I haven't, I've been thinking about it for years. Let's be honest. I feel like this is the story of everyone's life. We, we spend so much effort thinking about all the cool things we're going to do that it feels like we're working on them. Obviously I should have spent more time working on this book. So I had a good cry (laughs) and then just I'm going to do it, Christine. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to have to start all over again I, and use the sort of rough outlines of this. I'm not a writer. I don't know Me why. Neither. It's like, I think I also want to, I want to be a homesteader and I want to make sourdough bread. So I made this uh, sourdough starter and I c- kept it alive for weeks and I've been baking bread. I'm like, I'm going to be a homesteader. Gonna... I freaking hate the taste of sourdough. It's disgusting. It's sour. It's, it tastes like torn well, yeah, bread. It's super tangy. And then I've been bugging my husband for years that I want chickens. And he's like, Kaz, you hate eggs. I freaking hate eggs. Why do you want chickens if you... I Because, you see, it's like the zombie book. It all goes together. It's in my mind. I've built life. Like, the fantasy (laughs) Cass is going to do these cool, amazing things. And real life Cass has no actual desire to do any of these things. But thank you for bringing that up. I, I will finish it. I will publish it under a false name because there's no way in heck I'm having it associated with myself in any way. I want to really read bad. it so bad, no. so badly. So you know, bad. as you describe it, this is what it reminds me of. Do you ever go back, like when you first joined Facebook, like in 08, 07, 08, 09, right God. in there and, and read no. your old posts? Holy cringy. I read some of those and I'm like, I hate myself. Like, why am I the, like, why am I so awkward? Like, why did I think anyone needed to know this information? It's not even information. It's like, do you remember when Facebook was like, Christine feels, and then you like finish the sentence. Yeah. Do you remember that? And it was like, yeah, I'm tired. Like that was the whole post. <laughs> it was so dumb. I also like the things that I thought were so epic years ago were like with the zombie book. Like I thought I had this really unique idea and this take on things. It's just a crappier World War Z. Like it's been done better. And I must have watched that movie and then 
like thought it was my own idea. So T- taking a teenage as, twist on it. Yeah, as I'm getting older, I'm just realizing I just <laughs> I'm an idiot. And also, this <laughs> people should really look at this and feel inspired <laughs> because somehow I've hobbled and cobbled together a life that's pretty great. And I mean, if I can do that, if I can find these little hacks and shortcuts to live a life that isn't horrible, anyone can do it. Anyone. Because I'm a disaster 24-7. You know, I, you might disagree with this. I kind of feel that way about running because I was never a runner. I was an athlete. I was a swimmer and a cyclist, um, but not a runner. Like we had to go run a mile sometimes before swimming. And I was like, kill me now. My face would turn like this, the color of a tomato. And my other teammates were like, are you okay? And I'm like, this is what happens. Like when I, you know, and I'm wheezing and I'm like passing out and, and all this stuff. But the truth is that I'm stubborn and I always Mm. wanted runner's legs. You know what I'm saying? I find that attractive. Like I aspired to have runner's legs. So when I was like 28, I was like, I'm going to be a runner. Darn it. I'm going to do the couch to 5k program. Literally day one is you jog for one minute and then you like walk for five minutes. Yeah. And I've heard jog for one minute. It's literally one minute, 60 seconds. And I took a journal back then. And like my day one where I jogged for one minute was, I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like my eyeballs are going to explode. Blood is running out of my ears. My heart will explode. My legs feel like bricks. Like, how can anyone do this? That was my day one running experience. I've done three marathons. If I can go from that to marathons, I'm telling you, anyone can do it. I mean, I feel the exact same way about organization. I feel the same way about getting your house under control. And it comes down to what we talked about in the beginning. It's mindset. It's mindset. So when I think about fitness and working out, I'm like, that's horrible. It's the worst thing. I would never, I'd rather do anything else. And the difference is you changed your mindset right in the beginning. You changed it and started looking at it in a different way. And that's what I did with my house. Mm -hmm. My house was a dumpster fire and I would say it's not fair and why do I have to pick up after everyone? Why do I have to be the one who always does the cleaning and that? And I told myself this story and then one day I just flipped it to, you know what? I deserve to have a tidy house and there's got to be a shortcut here. There's got to be a way to hack this. You know, I'm going to work smarter, not harder. I'm going to figure a way of making this easier. And the only thing that changed was the way that I thought about my home. And I guess I hear what you, uh, I think I hear what you're saying is I need to change the way I think about fitness because I mean, I went on vacation with you and you're an insane person. You'd get up in the morning and go work out for a couple hours. And I'm like, what the heck's wrong with freaking Christy? She's crazy over there. But then afterwards you're like, wow, that felt good. Like I can tell you enjoy it now. You do. Mm-hmm. You're doing this because you enjoy it. And I feel the same way about taking care of my home now. Isn't that bonkers to say? I like, nobody likes the cleaning of the dishes and that crap. I I don't enjoy that part. I enjoy the feeling afterwards. And Mm -hmm. I assume working out's the same way. It's like, man, it's worth it though. You you do get to a point. Is that what you're saying? you You might agree with this where, as far as working out goes, you do fall in love with the process. And, and as you get fitter, it does get easier. Like some, some people, some athletes will be like, it's, it's always hard. You just go faster. And while that's true, like they're still working hard. You can go from this point where you can like run for one minute and feel totally wrecked to you can run for an hour and feel a little tired, but re-energized. So it does get easier. And the process of moving, uh, turns into like a meditative state. They call it flow when you get into the Mm. flow and man, that's, I think that's why people keep doing it. You just chase that high of feeling like everything is connected and you're one with everything via movement. And it's, it is an excellent place to be, although it takes time to get there much like I would imagine decluttering and organizing and figuring out what style works for you, because then you come home, you're out, you come home and you're like, "Ah, I'm home Mm -hmm. and it's relaxing and it feels good. Yeah, I I mean, I do. I feel that same like high when my house is kind of out of control and I can get it back there quick. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, like I accomplished something. This feels good. And I get so physically ill now when things look messy because I've 
been in a place for so long where things are just always tidy. I feel like it's different. You genuinely work hard. I am very lazy, Christine. Like I No, I'm lazy. Don't. I'm totally lazy. I'm so lazy. I want a hack and a shortcut for every single thing. So I really have found that with my house. And I guess that's what I'm on the hunt for when it comes to my health and fitness. But I, I don't think it's, I'm not going to find it in a pill. I'm not going to find it. I'm, I think the shortcut is probably the same as the shortcut is for getting your house under control. And that's getting up and just getting started. The shortcut is doing a little bit every day. That's where I've had success in every area of my life. And I don't know why I haven't, you know, tried that same approach to fitness. And I know why it's my mindset, just like you with clothing. It's my mindset. You know, I really like for any new habit is the principle of just one. So you just pick one thing and give yourself permission to stop after whatever it is for you. You know, if it's running or cycling or Zumba or weights or it doesn't matter. You know, step one is just put the clothes on. Mm -hmm. Like like that first week, you don't even have to do anything. You're just putting on the workout clothes. Just put the clothes That's on. all God, you're doing. And then that. the next week, like, let's say you want to go for a walk. It's still snowing where I live, but you know, regardless, you could say, I'm going to go for a walk today. I just have to go one block done. Mm -hmm. Stop, go back to my house. I have permission to quit. You're just developing the habit of now. I don't have to force myself and think about it anymore. I get up and I walk around the block just one, just one time. I love that. Yeah. I'm feeling inspired to maybe not just dust my treadmill, Christine, but maybe get my lazy butt on that treadmill for just, one just show. Put the clothes on. Yeah. One show. I do. Sometimes and I, know I do one YouTube video. Like I want to watch someone that's like a little bit of a guilty pleasure. And I'm like, nope, I'm going to save it for the treadmill walk. And so here's the thing. I'm going to say the same thing with putting your clothes away. You only got to do one basket, just one basket. Or what if it's you a know, really big basket? <laughs> just, just, just the top of the basket. Just the top. Too many top, top of the so basket. <laughs> just, just the tip. I feel like there's yeah, a joke God. in there somewhere. Is it, there's a naughty joke. Uh, <laughs> you know what's so cool? Like fitness is your jam. Every I talk to a lot of experts because I interview amazing people on my podcast all the time, and I'm always like looking at them. Like, how are you so awesome at this? Like, I want to be awesome like you. And the secret is the same. It's the same secret for every single person and it isn't working harder and it isn't being more disciplined and it isn't any of that crap that we think we have to be it's just doing a little bit every day it's consistency it's a tiny mm -hmm. step consistently every day doing a small habit and i don't know why i resist this like i don't know why i think some things are going to be not uh, like this approach isn't going to work for those certain things but it seems like this is the same for fitness and getting your house under control and your finances. I just talked to Lisa in homesteading and she's like, I just started with planting a tomato plant. You know, she's a homesteader mm -hmm. now with a whole freaking farm. But step know. one was, I'm just going to grow tomatoes this year. And next year I'm going to add cucumbers. And the next year I'm going to add some peppers. And then maybe I'm going to start making a sourdough bread. And then I'm going to get a couple chickens. And before you know it, she's got a freaking farm. She's having her eighth baby. And I'm just I like, know. I and saw that. And I was like. Bag. And her house is so tidy. She's and amazing. she eats healthy. And she's fit. Like she's. But to talk to her. It, nothing feels like effort and work because it's all been small, tiny steps that mm -hmm. have added up. And that's definitely how I got my home under control and how I started my organizing business. And every area of my life where I've had success, nothing's been a dramatic habit change. None of it. So I know that I need to take that same approach to my health and fitness. And it starts I'm think of you. with not eating a can of nuts before bed. Chocolate nuts, chocolate Choc candy chocolate nuts. nuts. Listen, I heard this. I don't know if it was a podcast or on the radio, or maybe I saw it on Instagram. I'm not sure. I don't know where the source came from, so I cannot quote the source. However, this is the weight loss plan that literally works for everybody. It's called the seat method. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for it? I Stop hope it's not eat less and work more. Everything all the time. laughing 
laughing when I heard that. Stop eating all the time. That's the, <laughs> it's the seat method. That's what it is. Stop oh my gosh. I laughed so hard eating. and I was like, oh, you mean that cinnamon toast crunch video that I'm filming right oh, now where I'm like shove it, shoveling cinnamon toast crunch cake and cookies in my face? That's not a good plan. How dare you? God, that's de that's really sad and depressing. But no, it's it's true. I'm eating out of boredom. And the thing is, the more so, I I tried to shortcut my health. I had weight loss surgery. I literally this is this. I, I'm presented with two options, Christine. I could stop eating all the time, or I could cut my guts out. And I'm, or I could maybe choose a banana instead of a cookie, or I could cut my intestines out. I could walk around the block sometimes or i could cut my guts out and i was like well, i'm cutting my guts out i mean obviously that's the option i go down and then insane thing is yeah i lost a, a lot of weight and now i'm gaining it back like i it didn't fix the root of the problem it was so much awfulness really like for what at the end of the day for what i'm just back into old habits i'm stretching that pouch back out and it comes down to i have to change my mindset and stop. I need to stop looking at food as a reward and a treat and I deserve it and start looking at it as fuel for my body, which is what it is. And I need to stop looking at exercise as punishment. It's not fair. And I have to do this to lose weight and looking this at like I'm strengthening my body because I deserve it. And that isn't a mindset that you can just like it takes practice. And mm -hmm. that's the mindset I had to change about my home. I had to stop looking at it as, oh, I got to clean up, pick up after my husband, pick up after my kids, do the dishes again. It's not fair. I'm tired. And I changed it to, I deserve a clean kitchen. I deserve a home that feels effortless. I deserve a space that I'm proud of that looks beautiful. I, I deserve this. I deserve to be in control of my environment and not have my stuff controlling me. And the more I told myself that, even though my house was a disaster and I wasn't doing the work, the more I told myself that, the more my space changed. And I hate those people. Am I that person who says that? Bleh. But it's true. <laughs> but once you realize that it's true, I think you just want everyone to be as content as you are once you've found the solution. That's what it is. Like once you've found it and you're like, oh my gosh, this changed everything. I need to tell everybody because I want them to know how awesome life can be with so little effort. Like you want them yeah. to experience the joy in an organized home. I want them to experience the joy of feeling strong in your body. Mm -hmm. And you can't force people into that. They want to have to do it. Like they, they mm -hmm. have to want to do it. Am I saying that right? Did that make sense? Yeah, it does. They have to want to get there. And you're just like, let me help you. I can help you with it. Like it isn't all or nothing too. And that's what I really want everyone to know. So we do this thing where we're, oh, we're going to have a clean house and we're always going to have the kitchen clean before bed every night. And then one night we're tired. It, it looks or we're not feeling well or we're busy and everything gets like messy again. And we're like, well, I guess that was pointless. I guess I'm giving up. There is no end goal here. So there is no, like you haven't failed. You just start again tomorrow. And it's easier if you do a little bit every day, for sure, because when you fall off track, it's harder to catch back up. But it's all about just being consistent on a daily basis in a little, small, baby way. And yet, and yet, this is why I fail when it comes to health. Because I say to myself, I can't eat junk food. I can't have sugar. I, I have to eat clean. And then I mess up and I'm like, well, see, I can't do it. I'm too weak. I might as well not even try. And I think this, whether it's your spending, you're like, I'm going to save money and you mess up and you buy some amazing thing that's gorgeous on you, but you shouldn't have bought it. We're like, well, well, I suck at saving money. I might as well spend every dime. Or like you put something on the credit card. You're like, well, see, I can't control myself. Oh, well, I'll be in debt forever. Life isn't like that. It isn't all or nothing. We're all going to mess up and we just get right back on the horse. It's that consistency that that gets us the life we're craving and the life we deserve. Do you have to declutter now? All the freaking like, time. You, all the time? How often do you declutter now? At least once a week, something's leaving my house. Like, yeah, do, you, do you do things. the, I'm just taking a bag, I'm getting rid of 10 things, you do five minutes? All the time. Doing? All the time. Yeah, I like the 21 item toss because I feel like 21 items is, it's enough that it pushes you out of your comfort zone, but it's not enough that it's still easy. I can do it in five minutes. And for me having a number, I have ADHD. So it keeps me focused. 
it keeps me like, oh, I'm only at 18. I better keep going. If I mm-hmm. wasn't doing that, I think I'd open up a drawer and maybe toss a couple things and be done. That 21 number that I'm hunting for really keeps me in the zone and keeps me focused. And honestly, I do it all the time. And then my closet every season, so twice a year, if not three times a year, I de- make a huge declutter. I don't know if I have a shopping problem, Christine. Like, where is this all coming from? But well, I was going to always ask, find more. How, how much are you on Amazon? No, that, that's not what I was going to ask. It's a lot. It's a lot. But how soon do you get Amazon purchases? Yeah, then it's the next day, and I have it's bad. I'm ten days. Oh god, I'm ten days. So I would say if I got it the next day. I might have a bigger Amazon problem, but it's not super tempting for me because I'm like, "Ah, I don't want to wait that long. Eh, I don't need it anyway. It's a problem also because like, I don't really leave the house now. Why would I have to? Why would I? I don't have to go anywhere to buy anything. I don't, I can't tell you the last time I was in a store. I I filmed a Walmart video that I think that's the last time. I saw that Walmart video. Oh, that was great, by the I, way. That was your idea, by the way. So thank you very that much for that. When I, yeah, you were like, you know what you should do? You should do like things you should never buy at Walmart. And it was fun to do. It was fun to like get out of the house. So that's the other thing like that Amazon's, kind of, it's great because it's convenient, but it's not so great because I'm not engaging in the world like I used to. And I think this is an issue, not just for me, but I see it with my kids. They're hanging out with their friends online instead of going mm-hmm. out and hanging out with them in person. We're getting things delivered online. We're even working sometimes virtually online. And there's this real like, oh, almost like a disconnect from the rest of society that I, I've just become very aware of recently that I don't speak well with other human beings in oh, person. Oh, that's such a lie. You do I'd great say- with other human beings. Thank you. I just, uh, I'm very out of practice, especially after COVID. We went how long? I didn't even see my mother for a very long period of time. Long and time, so yeah. I'm really out of practice at interacting with other people. And I think the Amazon is adding to that. So <laughs> I've, my, I'm have i trying to give up Amazon is where I'm, I'm getting to. I'm trying to kind of give up those conveniences. And the other thing that I'm giving up, Christine, I just have to tell you, I'm trying not to Google everything anymore. So, you know, one's like, oh, you hear that song playing? Who's that artist? I'm trying to find it in my brain instead of picking up my phone and finding it everything in my phone. Because we're getting out of the practice of retaining information. Why would we mm-hmm. keep things in our brain when we can find it in our phone? And we're all, <laughs> I'm getting dumber. Is, does that make sense? We're all getting and dumber because so- we don't have to remember mm-hmm. anything. We don't. We don't have to remember anything. We don't have to really figure things out. We can how to, we can YouTube university, everything. And I'm starting to notice in my own life. And even with my kids, it's like, wait a minute. My daughter's like, mom, I don't know how to fry an egg. And she's like looking it up on the internet. And I'm like, how about you just crack an egg in a pan and like figure this crap out. Right. But we're kind of getting away from that. Does this make sense? I know I, we're getting off yes, topic, but yet yeah, no, what <clears throat> There's no topic for today. It's just we're just chatting. <laughs> so I've been trying to be more intentional, like put your freaking phone down, get outside, speak to people, try to remember things in your own brain, figure things out without looking up how to everything. I don't know. Just because it feels right. Does that make sense? Totally. You need a challenge in your brain. That's what it's sounding like. Something that... <laughs> Maybe, I don't know that you've talked about this on your channel or, or on any of your social medias. Do people know that you really enjoy karaoke? Oh my God, stop. <laughs> I, I love karaoke. I don't, I love to sing karaoke, but I love to watch karaoke even more. And it's got to be bad. It's got to be just bad karaoke because there's so much confidence going in there a lot of alcohol probably too but i'm so guilty we're all so guilty of this like really worrying what other people think of us and really worried about embarrassing ourselves or doing or saying the wrong thing and when you are at a bad karaoke bar and people are just like horrible but they don't care that's so liberating isn't it it feels like it's like yeah i want to tell you i I want to tell you you something about the karaoke that experience with you and karaoke like changed my whole perception on karaoke because because all the karaoke i've ever been to in my life was good singers showing off i'm tone deaf i am not good and i've had mean things said to me 
in my life. So I'm traumatized about singing in public. So <laughs> karaoke is like my most insecure place to be ever. So if someone pulls out a karaoke machine at a party, that's Christine's sign to walk out the door because the party's over, over for me. I'm not having any part of that. But you were so insistent that we go to this karaoke thing. And you're right. When it's bad, it's the best thing ever because everybody was bad. Every single person that went up there was bad. I think you were the best one. Oh my God. No, I can't see. It was, I, it's like a it dead was cat, amazing. but that's the point. It's a core memory for me now. Yeah, bad karaoke. It's a core memory for me too. That was, that was some best. epically bad karaoke. <laughs> I would never want to go to karaoke where people can actually sing. That sounds awful. Yeah, it's Why awful. would you want that? No, like you, karaoke is supposed to be bad voice cracking, cringing with embarrassment, watching them suck so hard, bad. And uh, <laughs> you can usually find the best bad karaoke when you're on a trip like that the resort puts on where it's just mm -hmm. people being terrible. But also, don't you have like so much respect for them at the same time? They just Absolutely. genuinely did not care. They're in a room full of a ton of strangers singing their heart out, totally blowing it, being awful and not caring what other people think. And I just, I find that so admirable that I just love watching it. You're right. It was super admirable because they were more brave than I was. It was, True. it was a really good experience for myself. And I'm excited because I wanted to do Ice Ice Baby with you and you, your face, I was like, oh, come on. you were like, no, absolutely not. But this makes sense because your karaoke experience is like good people. I think everyone should participate in bad karaoke because getting up on stage, you feel sick. You're so mortified, but it's also such a it's like you got, it's like a bucket list in life. You got to sing some bad karaoke. Okay. This is my promise to you right now. It's being recorded. Okay. The next time we're at a bad karaoke place, I will either do Ice Ice Baby or Bohemian Rhapsody. I can do either one. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm holding you to it. We got to go Only back on vacation. If we like just head for bang the, you know, the guitar part of it's Bohemian happening. Rhapsody, right? We have to. It's happening. It's happening. Yes, or both. I think we do both of those songs. <laughs> we do an encore, Christine and Cass together on stage. It's going to be so bad. But let's give ourselves permission to suck and to suck in front of other people. And I think this is like a lesson that goes with everything, right? I know for myself, I'm like, oh, I should run, but I, what will people be in? People always make fun of the way I run, that I run like a duck, and I do. There's a lot of arm flapping when I exercise. So. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm, I just like, I don't want to do it in public, but like, maybe I'm just going to do that prancer size and just embrace the fact that I look like oh an my gosh, idiot while I'm exercising. Prancer size. I'm dead. Oh my gosh. I remember that. That could be my new thing where I'm just out frolicking as I exercise on purpose, doing it badly because I shouldn't care what other people think. And we can all learn a lesson from bad karaoke just about life. You know, I, it's something I try and teach my kids that it takes a lot of bravery to be bad at something new. Yes, it does. You have to be willing to be bad at something in order yeah. to learn something. That's a hard lesson. It is a hard lesson. I know you have a pet peeve when you go and organize other people's houses. Do I have a pet peeve? What's my you pet do. peeve? You said it to a, lot a few times. Peeves. Do you what know what is it is? It? It's, no. it's usually in the kitchen. You're doing pantries and it's the huge box of, is it cookies? Oh God, or is it dad's chips? cookies? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's bulk shopping. Is that what you it's were going to say? bulk shopping. Are you saying you're anti-Costco? I am. You know what? I have a Costco membership and I feel bad, but I am anti-bulk food shopping. And here's why. I feel why. like you're coming for me right now. I know you really like this, but I, I like feel it. like there are, there are people who are doing this well. There are people who are like managing their inventory and rotating their stock and actually using thing up. And then there's people who are using this as a way of like appeasing anxiety. So whether they had financial issues in the past, or maybe they didn't, there was a time in their life they didn't have a lot of food, or they're somehow thinking that this is going to save them money in the long run. And what ends up happening, I go to their home to organize and I find so much expired food and so many things they're not using. And they're rebuying things over and over and over again because they can't find what they already had. And 
all in the name of either saving money or being prepared. They're miserable in their kitchen. They hate cooking. They can never find anything. Everything's always a disaster, but it's coming from a place of the best intentions. And so that's why it's a pet peeve for me because it's so hard for me to get through to people because in their mind, like this is the right thing to do. And yet it's having really negative consequences on their finances, on their self-esteem and on the way their home is functioning. And so, yeah, I, I do hate the bulk Eat the bulk shopping. I can't tell you how many boxes of dad's stale cookies I've thrown out. 275 pounds of expired food. We we weighed it. And I know people say, it's still good. It's still good. But the homeowner was like, I'm not going to eat that. It expired 5, 10, 15 years ago. She physically wasn't going to eat it. And so for her, it was just wasting space. There are people who are like, yeah, I'll totally eat that can that's 15 years expired. But if you literally are not going to feed this to your family, why the heck is it in your home? Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Something that I coach people because I do coach them to be a little bit prepared to have, you know, have a decent pantry that you can pull from so you can cook and stuff. But is the issue that they're buying things they do? don't use like they're buying things because they think they're going to use it like a little bit of a fantasy self situation mm -hmm. or maybe they had kids the kids are gone and they haven't shifted their shopping technique yeah like what why are they buying these cookies if no one's eating cookies that's my question because they're cheap and but the number one offender that i find when i declutter kitchens is protein powder hands down protein powder is the number one thing that clutters up people's homes that I declutter on a regular basis because people buy it because they want to get healthy. They don't like the taste of that kind. So maybe they'll buy a different kind. Maybe they even have one that they do like the taste of. That stuff doesn't last that long. Like it does expire over a few years, but it's expensive. So like I spent mm -hmm. $60 or I paid $50. And so they'll have like 15 year old tubs of protein powder taking up cabinets and cabinets and cabinets in their kitchen. But the mm -hmm. idea of letting it go feels like wasting money. Same with keto food. A lot. I so many people are like, I'm doing keto. And they'll buy all these like sugar-free crap that they don't actually like or gluten-free or whatever it is, these fab food diets. And it just ends up clutter, expensive clutter in the kitchen mm -hmm. that people feel bad letting go of. So they never do. That's super interesting. When it comes to protein powder, protein products. It is something that we use a lot in my house. My husband, well, he has like a protein shake like every morning. So we actually do use ours, but you can get into this habit of like, oh, this one's on sale. I'm almost out of chocolate. Ooh, cool new flavor. Or maybe mm -hmm. you're like, oh, this one's on sale. Oh, it's kind of gross. Like I totally get that. Here's the one I'm telling you is super good. It's the Fairlife protein shakes, which you can get at Costco. It's not a huge case. It's there's like 12. They legit taste like chocolate milk. They're pre-mixed. Mm. So you just, you grab it and you drink it. They're not cheap. I'm not telling you that they're cheap because they're not. They are delicious. That's one that won't go bad. I'm telling you, if you want some chocolate milk for breakfast and you like, ha ha, joke's on you. You also got a protein shake. Like it's the Fairlife chocolate protein. And there, I mean, I, I think people should have protein powder in their head or protein drinks. I think that that's a good thing. If you don't like that flavor, you don't like that, or that's not part of your daily routine, it's okay to just throw those out. I know they were expensive, but it's okay to throw them out and make room. And if you are a bulk shopper, <laughs> But you um, have a lot of stuff that you like, oh, I forgot about those ketchups that were downstairs and I keep going to the grocery store and when we run out and just buy more ketchup and now I have expired unopened ketchup in the basement, maybe stop May buying that type <laughs> of stuff maybe in bulk. <laughs> I like your solution. Maybe don't do that. Well, because we think maybe it's going to make life easier, but it just is making life harder and it's taking up so much space. And like, I feel like it's easier to make a meal plan once a week. I look and see what I have in my pantry, in my fridge. I'm like, oh, those are about to go bad or this is going to expire. I'm going to make a meal out of that. And then I just buy to substitute the things I already have. And I mean, we, I went through COVID and I was okay. Like we went through literally a pandemic and I didn't run out of food. And so my mindset, I guess, has kind of shifted a little bit that I realized I don't need as much as I thought I did and that I'll be okay. So I think 
if you're doing that and, and it's working for you, awesome. Please don't stop doing that. If you're trying to do that because you think you should and you're failing, it's okay to just say, that's not me. You're not going to like me saying that. That's, I mean, that's your jam, but no, no. But the thing is, I do agree with you. Like I don't ever tell someone to buy something they're not going to use. And I do caution them because one of my biggest issues is food waste. Like you buy something, it goes bad. It goes in the garbage. So I like to, I like to save money on the front end. So in some portion that's being realistic with who you are, like stop buying the five pound bag of spinach from Costco, stop it. Like you're not gonna put it in your shakes. You're not gonna make salads out of it. It's gonna go slimy and it's going to end up in the garbage. And you might even stick it in the freezer. You're like, oh, I'll save it by sticking it in the freezer. It's gonna be there for a year. I just know Mm. that's 99% of people. So I don't want them to buy things that they think they're gonna use, but they won't. And it's taking up space too. Like that's the only thing we don't understand. So we were at Costco, we go through a ton of ketchup and I'm like, oh, Joe, we should get that huge. He's like, that wouldn't even fit in the spot in our fridge where we keep condiments. Like, yes, we might be saving money, but is it worth the amount of space that it's taking up? And the answer for us, we have a small space is no. Like we kind of have to, I want to buy things on sale, but I also have to be really like realistic of where is that going? I can't even tell you, I would say, 70% of the homes that I, maybe even 75 that I help declutter often have toilet paper and paper towels or cases of pop just stacked in corners of their home. So they've bought these things in bulk, but they doesn't fit in their appropriate amount of storage that they have for those things. So now it's in their living room or in the corner of their kitchen. They have toilet paper in their living room? Yeah. Lot, lots oh. of people, Christine, the spare bedroom, their bedroom, cases of pop, cases of water, food things, because there's no place for it to go because they're buying in huge amounts of bulk to save money. But the spots where those go, it doesn't fit the store. Everything's full. So now it's taking away their living space. And I would argue that's not worth it. If you don't have space in your home for this bulk to go, then you shouldn't buy in bulk and stop. You should just right. go to the store more often because it's taking away your living space. It's making your space feel cluttered. It's making you unhappy. You're hiring me as a professional organizer to come in and help you because you were trying to save $2 on toilet paper and all the little things, right? It's just adding up to excess. You know, you brought up the toilet paper and paper towels and I just feel like you saw my basement organization video and you're just like taking a stab at me. It's Are not you taking a you. stab it's, at me? It's because everyone. You should, just, <laughs> you should just see all the toilet paper and paper towels I have. You know what I learned? I don't use paper towels. I bought a case. I use one every three months. I don't know. But you have this. Okay, you have the storage. I, I mean, I once decluttered a house and during the pandemic, they were having a hard time finding Lysol wipes. So they right. bought cases and cases and cases and cases and cases when they could get them. And so now they have like shelving and shelving filled with Clorox, the disinfecting spray and the Lysol wipes. This was just after the pandemic. And I was like, okay. And they were like, we don't actually use Lysol wipes. It's just we couldn't get them at the time. So we felt really stressed. So we felt like we would need them. And I'm like, can we just, can they go? They're like, we spent so, we spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on those. I'm like, donate them. Can they just leave now though? Like, can they go? And there was so much anxiety about letting this go. We get caught up in like, what if we should just in case maybe, but when it's taking away our every day, because we're so worried about tomorrow, that's when we know there's a problem. That's when we need to like maybe rein it in a little bit and say, yeah, this doesn't actually make me feel safe. This doesn't actually make me feel better. This is only adding to my anxiety because now it's stealing my space too. But I think the intention is coming from, we want to feel safe. We want to feel prepared. We want to feel better. We want to ease the anxiety, but the actual result is often doing the opposite. Let's say someone is doing all these things they're buying in bulk they have soda stacked up in the middle of their living room and they're like i have all these things i'm prepared but i don't feel good my house is crazy and they're like where do i go for help what do i need like someone's at the very beginning of their journey mm-hmm. what one piece of advice would you give them or like if you had to like pick a video on your channel or your something on your website where would you send them so what i want people to know is that scarcity mindset is a real thing. And I think step one is that self-awareness realizing, oh, 
I have scarcity mindset. I feel like if I don't have things around me or if I'm not prepared, that something bad is going to happen. And therefore I need to collect in order to feel safe. I need to have to be prepared in order to ease that scarcity mindset. So just learning about this is really fascinating. And if you just one Google search, understanding this, the more you have, it reinforces scarcity mindset. So it reinforces like the more stuff I buy in order to feel prepared, the more I look at items as a way to make me feel safe, then it's a cycle. You're stuck in a cycle of, I need to buy in order to feel safe. I need to, right? We're now we're stuck in this cycle. And so to break that cycle, we throw things out that are actual garbage, that's actually trash, that is actually expired food. We go down and we say, I have 25 cans of beans. These ones are expired. I know I could still crack them open in the apocalypse, but I'm going to let these go to make room for things that I'll actually prepare and cook on a regular basis. And then we realize, oh, the world didn't end. It's not as stressful as I thought. It's not such a big deal. And then we just keep doing, we rinse and repeat. And I'm not suggesting everyone be minimalist. And if you, if that makes you happy to have food and prep, that's awesome. But just have that self-awareness. Is this scarcity mindset? Am I doing this to appease anxiety? And am I trapped in a cycle of using buying in bulk to self-soothe something else. Do you think that has anything to do with generations? Because as you were talking about that, it reminded me of my grandmother who was depression era. And when she was 88, I was at her house. She has since passed. I didn't know then, but it was only four months from going into a home. She was very tired. Her health was starting to decline. And we were trying to help her by going through her storage and her pantry and getting rid of things that she wasn't going to use so it would be easier for her. And she had home canned all of these things. As someone who like loves to garden does, many were not labeled and we pull things down. These were labeled like 1985 mm-hmm. that she home canned and she didn't know what it was. And we were like, grandma, can we get rid of this one? And she, her answer was always like, I'm not ready. Like I'm not ready yet to get rid of that thing. And I think that was definitely related to her upbringing and being so poor for so long because they were never wealthy their whole life. Like my parents were raised pretty low income. Like, so do you think that is something you find in older people generally because of those experiences? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is something we pass down to our kids too. And Mm. we just think this is the way it's always been done. This is the way it's supposed to be done. We're supposed to be preparing. We're supposed to be prepping. We're supposed to have lots of excess just in case. We see this as money. We see this as stability. We see this as safety. And that's a learned mindset that's been passed down. But we live in a different world now where there's a target or a variety store on every corner, we're no longer kind of in this, it could be gone tomorrow, so we have to collect today world. And yet we still, many of us still have that mindset that's been passed down. And there's also like fear with financial instability in the in society too, right? We have all this sort of like, well, what if, and what if a recession comes? And what if we have this and we better, and that just perpetuates that scarcity mindset and that fear. And the unfortunate thing is oftentimes when we really look at it, a lot of it comes from loss and trauma. So when I speak to people who have an excess of bulk food that they're not using, that they're not rotating, that is mostly expired, they're going to say, I had extreme poverty as a child. I didn't always have a school lunch. My dad lost his job. We didn't have money. I was scared. I was fearful. Even as an adult, I lost my job. I didn't know how I was going to feed my kids. I didn't know when our next meal was coming from. Fear, 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 and trauma, which has led to, I'd better have this to feel safe. And if we're doing it properly, that's awesome. If we're using it as a way to medicate our anxiety and not getting to the real root of why we have this scarcity mindset in the first place, the only thing we're doing is wasting money on food we're never going to eat. And we're wasting that food. That's all that's happening because we're still going to the store. We're still buying things in bulk. We still are doing the accumulating to self-soothe, but we're not eating it at the same rate. So it's all pretty sad. It's a sad cycle, that scarcity mindset. And it starts with self-awareness. Why am I like this? Why do I feel I need this? And then we can kind of walk those feelings through. 
When you go to people's houses and help them, do you find that you deal with that issue what percent of the time? 50% of the time? More? Yeah, there's always a reason why. I would say when it comes to food, 90% of the time it's financial instability at some point in their life. Financial mm -hmm. instability, the fear of going without, the fear of not having it or having experienced themselves or their parents going without. If I see they're kind of hoarding other things like clothing, it usually comes to, well, when they were younger, maybe they were made fun of because they didn't have the latest brands or they didn't feel like they had as many clothes, right? It all kind of really does tie into that anxiety, that self-soothe, that feeling of, yeah, soothing ourselves. Anytime someone's had a divorce, they're going to hold on to more because they've had, anytime you had something taken from you, you felt out of control, you've lost things that are out of your control, fire, flood, you're going to have this tendency to want to hold on to what's left and not have those things taken from you again. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to anxiety and trauma. It really does. So if we can understand that and realize that we can kind of, you know, get to the next step in our lives where we don't let our stuff control us and we don't let our stuff act as medication for the real root of the problem. That is so fascinating. Now that you're saying that, I had never equated like trauma to your tendency to hang on to things, whatever it is. But as you're describing that, and I think about people that I know, I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. It is all clear in my head. When did you learn that? Just dealing with people, you just picked it up over time? Yeah, dealing with people. And the more homes I went to, I mean, I've worked with thousands of people, but I've been in hundreds and hundreds of people's homes. And it's always like you walk in and you're like, there's trauma. You've lost something. Mm -hmm. You've had a flood or a fire or extreme poverty or, and it's always is the same. Like it's a different story, but the same root of the issue for everyone. It's very obvious now. You know, I don't know that this relates to exactly what you're saying, but it occurred to me because it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> I got a really nasty comment yesterday on one of my videos. Mean, just full on mean. It was one of those ones, usually I ignore them, right? So, you know, most of the time you're like, eh, you know, I can't please everybody. This one was like truly viciously attacking me. I was like, do I respond to it? Do I leave it? I don't sometimes I don't know the best thing to do. One of my viewers responded to her and she responded back, right? Cause that happens sometimes. And it came out that she lives, I don't know if you knew about the tra all the train derailments in Ohio, I believe it is, where it leaked all these toxic chemicals. It killed all the fish in the river and there were like these toxic clouds. They burned all the chemicals. It was in a few news stories, but it wasn't covered nationally. So it's not super well known. I think I saw it on Instagram, I believe, but the people who live there are like, they're getting sick and their water's polluted and they're really upset that it wasn't national news. So she lives right next mm. to that. Mm. And that came out in the comments. And I was like, oh, she's had a serious trauma recently. So her reaction to things I was saying, or like a funny clip that was meant to be humorous was taken in a very different way than what it was meant. And it was all based back to her personal trauma, which mm -hmm. I have found to be the case most of the time when mm -hmm. someone either lashes out like that or collects things. It's all very sad, isn't it? Yeah, because it's, I think it's human nature too. I would say most of the people who bully other people were bullied. If you're, if you're being mean like that to someone else, it's because you're hurting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really sad. And I think if you're being mean to yourself too, it's because you're really hurting and there's something deep down and we get confused. I think our wires get crossed in our brain sometimes, especially in our home. I've talked to so many hoarders, real hoarders who have pathways through their home. And it's always, it's not laziness ever. It's always the best intentions. They're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do the perfect thing. They're trying to make sure that they're not making a mistake. And it's like the wires got a little crossed in their brain and the way out of the bad, sometimes we're just creating more bad for ourselves in an attempt to make life better. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, life is hard sometimes, you know? It's hard. Yeah. It's hard, but it does take that outside perspective. It's that person who shines that mirror on you and says, you know what? 
I think maybe this is going on instead of what you think is going on. And then you're like, oh, mm-hmm. my God, the curtains have been raised. I'm seeing things in a new way. I've had a lot of therapy and just things I didn't realize about, too. I'm just like, what? wait a minute. It's been a journey, man. Self-awareness. It's an important thing. I'm a big fan of therapy, counseling, whatever you want to call it. I uh, did a little bit myself. If nothing else learning how to communicate really well and like put Mm -hmm. words to your expectations and feelings in a calm way. I think everyone needs that. Yeah. And learning to be, for me, it was like learning to be more aware of my thoughts and my negative thoughts. And I get really stuck in this cycle of, you know, downward spiraling and reinforcing. And then when we think something everywhere we look, we kind of see evidence to support that. So I'm going to just, we're going to end it with this. If you are a person who is like, I need to be prepared. Bad things are happening. I have to be, I have to have, and I have to surround myself just in case, just in case. Every time you look at the news, every time you look and you hear about there's a war in, in Ukraine or there's a toilet paper shortage, you know, in the Midwest, it kind of is like you're seeing evidence to support your scarcity mindset. And so you're reinforcing that. But just having the awareness to realize that and kind of like, well, what if? You know, maybe I don't need this much. And what it, what is the worst thing that could happen if I run out of toilet paper? What's the worst thing? And you walk that anxiety all the way down. You realize, well, it's not really that bad. That can help ease some of that and help you overcome some of those anxiety-inducing feelings. I think the worst case is like using old t-shirts or something, which is awful, which is awful. Oh, I was trying to think of the worst thing. I'm like, what's the worst? Taking a shower every time? Is it like using rags? Is Is that the worst thing? We ran out of toilet paper during the pandemic. Like there was nothing here. We ran out of toilet paper for two weeks. And what we found was Amazon was shipping like the wipes, like the flushable wipes. Uh So everybody still had those. And so we just used flushable wipes. And then my mom's like, I have two extra. So she dropped off toilet paper. And we really only had to use flushable wipes, I think, for like two days. And so it wasn't that big of a deal, right? It felt Mm -hmm. like at the time I was like, we have zero toilet paper. But we just adapted. We adapted. We pivoted. We we made it work. And now that was so positive experience for me because then I was like, oh, man, it's fine. It's all right. Mm-hmm. If there's a beef shortage, I'll eat more chicken. It's all right. <laughs> right. It eased a lot of my anxiety, actually just like seeing that the worst case scenario really wasn't that bad. I think that mindset can go to many, many different situations, including... This might be a weird segue. Teaching my teenagers how to approach situations like going to a party where you don't know anybody, introducing yourself to new people, going on a date for the first time. Like my son is 16 and I'm like trying to push him into asking someone on a date so he can practice. Like what's the worst that could happen? Walk me down the road of what's the worst thing that could happen when you ask a girl on a date. They say no, then you're no worse off than you are now. Mm -hmm. They laugh. Well, don't they giggle about weird stuff anyway? That's his biggest complaint. He's like, they, the girls move in a bundle of girls and they're all on their phone. He's like, I can't even get their attention. <laughs> yeah. I haven't noticed, like, I, I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old daughter and they have so much more anxiety than I did at that age. I don't know why. It's like, they're afraid of failure more. They're afraid of making a mistake more. They're just... It's like, uh, yes, they are afraid of failure. I will agree with that. I feel like one of my kids was specifically related to a sport coach who tended, like if you made one mistake, they'd pull them. And so it kind of Mm. reinforced this fear of making a mistake. I've protected my kids way more than my parents protected me from like feeling, having bad things happen and I've just like cushioned the landing, if that made sense. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anytime anything bad did happen, I was kind of there to like make it not so bad, which is totally something that's normal as a parent to want to do. But I wonder if all these softening the blows have made my kids a little soft. Does that make sense? And so Absolutely. I wonder, I even noticed some like some tendencies with my kids for their anxiety to be heightened because they've never really allowed themselves to have 
and I've never really allowed them to have those uncomfortable moments like when somebody laughs at you when you ask them on a date. They've never bombed on a test really bad or like failed a grade or you know, had somebody say, I don't want to be your friend anymore or got bullied in school like that. We don't have that anymore, which is great. Now we have this fuel for when something bad does happen or could happen, potentially, it feels more magnified than it should be. And I think as adults, we have this too. We overthink, we blow everything up to be what this big, ah, massive thing. And that is not healthy because it keeps us scared and it keeps us small, and it keeps us from stepping out of our comfort zone. And outside of our comfort zone is when real life happens, is when mm -hmm. amazing things happen, great opportunities. Staying in our comfort zone and just soothing that anxiety is a recipe for disaster. I don't personally struggle with anxiety. That's not one of my issues. I have other issues, okay, but that's not one of them. So that one is harder for me to wrap my brain around because I have not experienced it personally. However, I did hear someone describe it as the what if syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like your brain is constantly swirling. What if this, what if this, what if this, what if this? And one of the solutions to that was, I think he said action was a solution to that and coming up with an end to the sentence. What if blank, this is my plan. So you have a plan of action for all of your what ifs can really help combat that. What do you think about that? I think that's so good. And, but there are a lot of people too that overthink everything. And so that could get scary too, because having a plan for every worst case scenario can kind of make the, it feel even scarier. If you have a huge clutter problem, you have anxiety hands down because the reason you're not letting things go is because what if I make a mistake? What if I regret that? What if I have to buy it again? That was so expensive. I should probably sell it. What if my sister has a baby and then I got rid of all my baby clothes, but I know I'm not having a baby, but what if she has a baby and I should give it to her? And it's like, blah, 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 blah. your brain is like, okay. ah. and so the way I help clients overcome that is I just say, what if you just gave yourself permission to suck? And to be, it's like bad karaoke. Like, what if we just gave ourselves permission to just, it's okay to just throw that in the garbage. It's okay to just not find the perfect solution for everything all the time and give ourselves permission to take shortcuts and do things crappy. And when I go to a client's house who has a lot of anxiety about recycling and they're like, I want to make sure that this, I have to wash all the recycling and I want this, make sure that this get, all goes. And I'm like, please just put that in the trash. And it's like... <gasps> And I'm like, your time is worth more when we catch up on your house, when we get to a place where you are on top of things, then we can do things better. For now, we are in, you are the only thing that matters mode. You are top priority and we got to get you there as fast as possible. Put that in the trash. They will feel physically ill. They do it. They like, they feel sick. And then I'll say, okay, it's done. We're moving on. How do you feel? They're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Like, I wish I didn't do that, but I didn't die. And it's almost empowering. And okay, I am more important than that piece of plastic. And that is what we need to do. We need to kind of give that tough love, gentle push in order to allow someone to give themselves permission to do things bad, to suck. Almost every single hoarder is a perfectionist. That's really? why they're struggling. Yeah. They're perfectionists. They're terrified to make a mistake and they can't even sleep in their own bed. They can't even have a clean dish because they're paralyzed to screw up their life and to do things wrong. And so they're holding on to everything. And then that's reinforcing, reinforcing. And now they have this huge mountain that they've created because of indecision, because of just overwhelm, because their mind is going a mile a minute. Just give yourself permission to do it badly, to throw it out. You can always do it perfect later. Today, we're taking a shortcut. I think that's amazing. So we've been talking for a while and I would talk to you all day, but it's a long podcast. So I have so many things I want to talk to you about, but I'll, I'll do two quick, quick questions and then we'll finish it up. So number one is what do you like to watch on YouTube? Do you watch YouTube or no? No. 
I don't no, watch you don't. YouTube. That's okay. If I you do watch YouTube, to. it's like it's like crafting videos. I like to watch people make things for inspiration. I find if I'm watching other YouTubers, what happens is I start comparing myself. Mm -hmm. So I start, oh, that was so good. They said that and that was such a good video idea. And I start turning it into business and it's no longer fun. And comparison is the thief of joy. So when I watch people doing something that's similar to what I do for a living, I cannot help but get down on myself. So I avoid it like the plague. I try to stay off Instagram because the same thing, if I'm seeing someone organize a space, I will hate myself because they're doing it better. It looks prettier. Oh, I need to get a new house with all white closets and look at how they did the bins and look at how they filmed that. Ugh, ugh, I can't do it, man. It's not good. It's not good for my I, mental health. I understand what you're saying because I don't tend to watch people in my genre mm. who, who do what I do. I don't watch them, but I do. This sounds so dumb. I stumbled across a documentary yesterday and I went down a rabbit hole of these pro cyclists and they took novice exercisers, like I'm talking couch potatoes who had never been on a bike and had them train for six months and do the Leadville 100 mountain bike race at 10,000 feet. It's a hundred mile mountain bike race in six months. And I was like, this is fascinating. I can get into that because I don't make content like that at all. I guess. But, yes. Yes. But that was, that does that was great. I watch people pop pimples to fall asleep. <laughs> That's so right. I remember you said we, that. We, we just, we like different things, Christine. <laughs> I would, the bigger and I the would, grosser, the better. I would have nightmares. Oh, I would have nightmares best. if I did that. It's okay. Last question. Cause I ask everybody this one. It's the end of your life. Last meal. You don't have to cook it. You don't have to clean up. What are you going to be eating? Oh, like chocolate fudge brownies with vanilla ice cream, warm brownies with vanilla ice cream. Are there nuts in those? No, nuts no, in the brownies? that's gross. No nuts. Keep the nuts. That's awful. No, warm, creamy brownies with vanilla ice cream. It's all about chocolate and junk food for me. Keep your steaks, bro. Um, I want the brownie. Why can't you have both? I don't really like food real food like that. <laughs> Is that weird? Like I, yes, that is I weird. always get, I have like, I kid you not like $800 in keg gift cards upstairs in my gift card. People are always giving me keg gift cards. What, right? is, what, is, a, a, what is keg? It's a steakhouse here in Canada, oh, like a really okay. famous steakhouse. So it's really expensive. So like $50 a plate and people will often for Christmas or if I'm doing some, people are just constantly giving keg gift cards to me and I would rather eat anything else in the world. I I'm just, sure they I'm serve not something that's not steak. It's steak and like roast chicken and potatoes and stuff like that does not What's appeal to potatoes? me at all. I, I love I potatoes. Just, if it's a French fry, I'm down. If it's uh, <laughs> my food choices are like a trash can at a carnival. Think of all the things you can eat at a carnival. And that's what I, I gotcha. eat. Funnel cake, Oreos and fried butter all day in there. Yeah. Some candy, maybe some cotton corn candy, dogs. popcorn, corn dogs, popcorn. French mm -hmm. fries. There will be no, ew, you know, when you go to the place and they put some sort of fancy sauce on a plate and like two potatoes and a piece of meat. That is not, that's not happening for me. Oh my gosh. You are a riot. That is so funny. I'm determined to cook you something that you're going to like. If someone wants to find you somewhere on the internet, what are all of the many places that they could go? Cause you're everywhere. Yeah, you can just search Clutterbug and I would love it if you took the Clutterbug quiz. It's free. I don't even ask for your email. You just go to clutterbug.com and discover your organizing style. Get some self-awareness and lots of ideas that will work just for you. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Cass. We're going to leave it there. Thanks so much. I, I love chatting with you. Okay, I want to tell you a story okay. about this. I was going to ask what the hell, but I didn't want to ask. I'm okay. like, did she burn right. herself? Is this no. psoriasis? No. I don't know. It's fake blood. Oh my God. So here's what happened. This happened last night. So I'm taking a wilderness first aid course. Okay. So Good it's last you. night tonight and all day tomorrow. So it's like three days you take the test and then you're done. So we were doing scenarios. Okay. And I was the victim for one of the scenarios. And I was coached by our instructor on what I was supposed to do because the people coming in to survey the scene were supposed to do like a blood sweep, roll me over, 
we were learning like tourniquets and pressure points and pressure bandages and things like that. So we're on a college campus. It's like 8 p.m. So it's dark. And she had me lay like kind of on my stomach in this weird skitty wampus. And then she put this fake blood like on my wrist because I had an arterial bleed on my mm, wrist. And she's like, she goes, you're supposed to give a pain reaction. So they're supposed to squeeze your clavicle really hard. And then at that point I can like moan. So I'm giving a pain response, but I'm not like awake and alert. So I'm laying there as she goes inside to go get all the people. There's like four of us scattered around as victims. And I feel this like, Hey miss, are you okay? Like, are you okay? Hey miss, are you okay? But she's not squeezing my clavicle like that we're supposed to, to right. initiate a pain response. And so I'm just waiting. Are you okay? And I'm like, she is doing this wrong. Was she in the same class that I was? <laughs> and then I hear one of the guys who's also a victim, Christine. So I look up and I'm like, Hey, Oh, you're not in our class. It was a student who found me with like blood all over my wrist, unconscious oh on my the ground. God, that She's person's dialing 911 on her phone. Oh my God. You've just, you've traumatized that poor person. <laughs> You're very good at playing dead. I was like, oh my gosh, we're doing a training. We're doing a training. I'm fine. I thought you were one oh of the my people. God. She's like, oh my, oh my God. gosh. Are you? She thought she found a dead body. Yes. Oh. And, and I was like, I'm fine. And I'm like, you see all the other people laying around? We're doing a scenario. This is a training. It's like, hilarious. I'm totally, this is fake blood. This is fake. And it didn't wash off, obviously. I got it off of my coat with the Folex spray. Okay. But it Good has not come you. off of my skin. I thought you had some sort of festering wound, and I didn't yeah. want to ask in case it was like a sensitive thing or something. No, but no, it's fake blood <laughs> that I used to traumatize a poor college student last night. I woke up with like extreme stomach pain, and I thought I was having pancreatitis, but it could be the copious amounts of candied nuts I had last night. But either way. So if you see me sw profusely sweating, it's because I just have like a dagger. I'm drinking plain tea with no sugar, just like a tea bag and a mug over here. That's when you know that I might be dying. Dude, I that might doesn't be sound dying. good at all. <laughs> I'm like, when is the point where I realize I need to make healthier eating choices? Like, is it before or after I lose another organ? We're going to see. What I organ have you lost? Do you not have a gallbladder? My I don't have a gallbladder. So I, okay. I woke up and I was like, oh, it's got, can gallbladders grow back? Cause it feels like gallbladder pain. So if you see me just like pouring sweat, it's because I ate myself into agony. If I die, <laughs> know that you are the last person that I've spoken to. And here is what I'm going to say. It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh.